too strong. <laughs> Okay, good morning everybody. Welcome, continuing on our, our theme of uh, Elbow Month at the University of Washington, we had uh, Dr. Sassoon's uh, case presentations about a month ago that were on the elbow, and then we had Dr. King who was here uh, about a week ago for Lecoq. And uh, this morning we're gonna talk about uh, terrible triad injuries with Dr. Beingessner, Dr. Hanel, and uh, Neil Tarabatker. Uh, first, just a couple of uh, housekeeping things. Lots of uh, compliments for our residents uh, in the last month, and so I can't take the time to read all of these, but I will briefly uh, mention them. Uh, Eric Magnuson, is Eric there? Eric, you uh, received really remarkable uh, Kudos uh, from the emergency room at Harborview for all the good work you've been doing there, so thank you. Uh, Kari Bringy uh, received similar compliments. Is Kari here? No. Kari received similar compliments from uh, for her work at Children's Hospital, taking care of kids. Colin, uh, you were uh, noted for your uh, prompt attention uh, to a patient in the ICU, uh, and you were thanked for coming to examine that patient multiple times throughout the course of the night. Call him here. Yeah, thanks. And uh, this one is for uh, Dr. Feruzabadi, who hopefully is uh, watching at Harborview. Uh, Reza was congratulated by the Dean for being awarded the 2015 Young Investigator Award from the uh, Washington Western Orthopedic Association. Uh, similarly for Dr. Hanel, uh, who uh, some of the residents were with myself uh, and Dr. Tatesman at the WSOA meeting when uh, Doug was awarded the Lifetime Achievement Award. So he also has a letter from the Dean and uh, at this, uh, also at the WOA meeting, the Western meeting, Calvin is being uh, congratulated for receiving a uh, resident uh, award for this project. So thank you, everybody. So we're going to start with Dr. Tara Batka introducing uh, the talk on terrible triad elbow injuries. All right. I'm uh, Neil Tara I'm one of the R4s, and I'll be focusing on the anatomy and biomechanics of terrible triad injuries. So the elbow is a unique joint in that it contains three distinct articulations. 
the ulnar trochlear joint, which is responsible for flexion and extension, and the radiocapitellar and proximal radioulnar joints, which are responsible for pronation and supination. All of these articulations contribute to elbow stability, but it's really the ulna that's the centerpiece for the stability of the elbow. There are many different structures that contribute to uh, elbow stability, and they can be broken up into primary stabilizers and secondary stabilizers. The coronary process is the primary bony stabilizer, and it acts as an anterior and varus buttress. It's made up of a tip, a body, and an anterolateral and anteromedial facet. And the anteromedial facet serves as the insertion site for one of the primary ligamentous stabilizers of the elbow, which is the MCL. And then you have the LCL on the lateral side adding stability. The medial collateral ligament uh, provides stability against valgus and posterior medial stress. It can be broken up into three different bands, but it's really the anterior bundle that's the most important in terms of resisting valgus stress. The lateral collateral ligament uh, provides stability against varus and posterior lateral stresses. It can also be broken up into three different uh, bands, and it's the lateral ulnar collateral ligament that's the primary resistance to varus stress. The secondary stabilizers of the elbow become increasingly important when the primary uh, elbow stabilizers are damaged. The radial head acts as an anterior and valgus buttress, while the flexor and extensor mass origins prevent against valgus and varus stress, respectively. The other el uh, muscles around the elbow act as dynamic stabilizers. So when we talk about elbow dislocations, you can break them up into two overarching categories, simple dislocations and complex elbow dislocations. Simple elbow dislocations are largely capsular ligamentous injuries, and the secondary stabilizers are usually intact, and there's no associated fractures. So when these dislocations get reduced, they have an inherent stability, and they don't generally need operative intervention to provide stability. Complex dislocations, on the other hand, are highly unstable, and they tend to need operative intervention in order to provide that stability. Uh, there are three main types, translecranon, montasia, and then terrible triads, which is what we'll be focusing on today, which again are elbow dislocations with associated coronoid and radial head fractures. So Hotchkiss coined the term terrible triad because of their historically poor outcomes. There's disruption of both your primary and secondary stabilizers. And historically, when these fractures were fixed, they had a tendency to go on to failure, either for recurrent instability, and that's mainly because people didn't know what to fix. There wasn't a great idea of the uh, biomechanics of these injuries. Dr. Bongessner will touch on this a little bit later, but even with current fixation techniques, the, the surgical management's difficult because of small fragments. And even if they do go on to heal, uh, they have a high tendency to become stiff and to develop arthritis, which is what Dr. Hannell will touch on. I think this image uh, illustrates just how much energy occurs and how much damage occurs with these, uh, with terrible triads. Just to orient you, this is the lateral side, this is the humerus, lateral epicondyle, this is the forearm down here. And there's been uh, very little surgical dissection, and you can see that the uh, Lateral collateral ligament and common extensor tendons have been completely evolved. The arrowhead is pointing to a coronoid fracture that's sitting in the joint, and just beyond that over here is damage to the radial head. So early on, people realized that these fractures don't do well. Uh, in the 1920s, McWhorter uh, saw that these don't do well with non-operative management, and so he encouraged operative fixation and early motion. And then really it was in the 80s that we began making a lot of progress in understanding the actual biomechanics of these injuries. And Reagan and Morey in their paper in 1980 uh, showed the importance of the coronoid to elbow stability and basically showed that the larger the coronoid fragment, the more sta unstable the elbow. Also in the 80s, Josephson uh, looked at 24 patients who underwent operative management uh, for terrible triads, and they came to the conclusion that simple uh, dislocations do well and fracture dislocations do not. Uh, Dr. Bangas will talk about some more encouraging literature, but even more recent literature shows just how difficult these fractures are to treat and how the outcomes aren't always great. And in a more recent paper by Ring, uh, 
uh, they concluded that coronoid fractures uh, don't do as well. The mechanism of injury is a fall and outstretched hand, much like other injuries to the upper extremity, and it's a valgus axial load and supination forces that cause damage to the lateral collateral ligament and the rest of the characteristic fracture patterns. In terms of elbow dislocations in general, both simple and complex, the classic thought was that the forces begin on the lateral side and then transfer over to the medial side. So you'll almost always have involvement of your lateral collateral ligament. Uh, and then as the forces move anteriorly and posteriorly across the elbow, you get your associated coronoid fracture, associated radial head fracture. And then depending on how much energy is left, you can get involvement of your uh, MCL. There is some new literature that suggests that the forces may actually begin on the medial side for simple elbow dislocations. Uh, this is a paper out of HSS that looked at uh, 16 simple elbow dislocations, MRIs for 16 uh, simple elbow dislocations, and they showed that the MCL was completely torn in all 16 cases and that there were variable pathology to the LCL with sometimes uh, not being involved at all. But in the case of terrible triads, we know that the LCL uh, is always involved as part of the uh, disease. So the diagnostic workup, uh, besides you know physical exam and uh, routine workup, the you always get a closed reduction, uh, and then X-rays and sometimes CT scan to help uh, delineate the fracture fragments. I think these X-rays demonstrate why terrible triads and complex uh, elbow dislocations need operative intervention. So once the elbow has been reduced, there's still subluxation of the ulnohumeral joint. There's still a displaced coronoid fracture as well as a displaced radial head fracture. So the only way you'll obtain stability is by uh, fixing the fragments. CT scan is not always used, but I think it can be helpful. If you look at the image on the left, uh, it may just look like a simple elbow dislocation or you may not depreciate that it's actually a terrible triad. So once the elbow is reduced, you can see the coronoid fracture as well as a small radial head fracture. So is non-operative management viable? The short answer is no. I mean, it's very, under very rare circumstances, could you uh, treat these non-operatively? You'd have to have a concentrically reduced joint. It has to be stable and it basically has to behave like a simple elbow dislocation, which these generally do not. So in terms of surgical management, I will leave that to Dr. Bangas. Right, good morning. We're going to talk a little bit about how to manage a terrible triad operatively and how you kind of tackle these complex injuries. So. The main thing that most people ask when they're figuring out how to fix a terrible triad is where do you start and what should be fixed first. And so most of the textbooks or literature will tell you to fix the damaged structure sequentially from deep to superficial. And that sounds straightforward, but how do you actually do that? Because there's a lot of stuff in the way, and so we'll just go through a good way to get at the terrible triad, especially getting at those deep structures. Typically, we like to fix these patients supine on an arm table, and you can use a posterior midline incision, and this is a good idea because sometimes you have to go around both the medial and lateral sides of the elbow. Most of the work's going to be done on the lateral side for the majority of these cases, but should you need to go over and look at the medial side, you can just simply lift up the medial skin flap and get over there as well. If you are supine to do that, just make sure the patient has good external rotation of their shoulders so that you can get medial if you need to. First thing you want to do is address the coronoid, but before you do that, you want to actually take a look at the radial head because it's going to be in your way. So you work through the lateral disrupted soft tissues, and then if the radial head is not going to be fixable, go ahead and make the radial neck cut and get all those pieces out of the way, and that gives you a really great view to the coronoid. If it is fixable, it's still possible to get to the coronoid. It's a little bit harder, but you just basically have to push those pieces out of the way. And sometimes you can take advantage of the fact that the elbow is unstable, so you can actually dislocate the elbow and get another view around the front as needed. If you're going to move the radial head pieces out of the way, just be a little bit careful that you don't disrupt the periosteum around the edge, because that's going to be important for healing. So if you can just gently tuck those out of the way, you can usually get a pretty good view of the coronoid and then still have fixable radial head pieces later. In order to fix the coronoid, there's a couple of ways of doing it, depending on the size of the fragment. So if it's a smaller piece, you can typically fix this with a suture, and you can see that in this illustration here. Here's the back of the ulna here, and here's the coronoid and the coronoid fracture right there. And you can see the sutures coming up through the back of the ulna, through the coronoid. You typically grab a little bit of the anterior capsule, 
and then bring it back through the coronoid. And then as you pull these sutures tight, you can see that the coronoid piece reduces. And really, not, you're not trying to actually get a structural fix to the coronoid that's going to give you stability. This little piece is not going to keep the elbow stable. But what is going to keep the elbow stable in this situation is pulling down this capsule. And that's really the whole point of fixing these smaller coronoid pieces. If you have a larger coronoid piece, which is a little bit less common, typically in terrible triads, you're going to see a type 1 coronoid fracture. But if you do see a type 2 or 3, you can typically get at these with screws. And you can typically see around the front and hold this reduced with either a clamp or with a shoulder hook or a dental pick, and then get a screw in from posterior to anterior into that fragment. So after the coronoid has been addressed, the next thing you want to do is replace or repair the radial head. Terrible triad injuries typically are associated with more comminuted fractures, and so you have to decide intraoperatively which type of fixation you're going to use. We do know that there's a high incidence of complications if you fix radial heads with more than three pieces, and that's just in general with fixing radial heads. And you have to remember, again, that the radial head is really important to stabilizing the elbow, and so in getting that lateral column stable will give you a lot of stability to a terrible triad injury. So you do not want to do tenuous fixation on the radial head. So if in doubt, replace. And I would say the majority of terrible triads that we fix, we end up replacing the radial head. We do know that open reduction internal fixation can work well, but this is typically, again, for the less comminuted fractures. So the Mason type 2 fractures um, tend to do better with that. And there's been some papers that show that those highly comminuted fractures really tend to do quite poorly with fixation. So again, always make sure the patient is prepared for radial head replacement. The other thing to remember is that the x-rays will often underestimate how comminuted the radial head is. And so you may look at the plain film and think that, yes, I can fix this. And even a CT scan may look fixable. However, you have to always be prepared for a radial head replacement, because sometimes when you actually look at the fragments, you realize that they're not as fixable as they appeared radiographically. So if you're going to fix them with screws, there's a couple of lots of options, actually. Uh, typically, you like to get out smaller things, like from a modular handset. So screws as small as one to five screws. Um, are helpful. Cannulated screws can be helpful as well. And you can place them right through the articular edge of the radial head as long as they're countersunk so that they don't interfere with forearm rotation. This is a really nice technique, and I prefer this over plates, which I'll show next if you do need to do something that crosses the radial neck. Um, and this is a technique where you can fix the radial head and then put cross screws down uh, more distally into the radius. And this is nice because these are all countersunk, and so you're unlikely to have impingement and rotation with this technique. So it's a nice low profile way to fix the radial head, and it tends to work very well and is stable. There's lots of different ways to fix with plates as well, but it's important to remember to keep the plate in that safe zone where the patient can rotate. So there's only certain fractures that will actually be amenable to plate fixation. If you're going to use it as a buttress, it really just depends where on the radial head that fracture is. And we do know from several studies that plating actually does cause an increased chance of poor rotation. And oftentimes, patients who do undergo plating do need them removed. So that's something to remember. This was a study from JBGS showing a really nice plating technique. And they had excellent results. However, reading the fine print, most of these patients required a repeat trip to the operating room for hardware removal and probably some type of release um, for elbow rotation. So just something to keep in mind. So if the radial head's not fixable, which is, again, true in the majority of cases, then you're looking at doing a radial head implant. There's tons of options for radial head implants, and I think that the bottom line is to just have one that you're comfortable with and that works well in your hands. There's not one right or wrong. There's lots of different design philosophies for radial heads, but again, using one that you're comfortable with and works well in your practice is appropriate. We typically like to use a modular type of implant so that you can size the stem and the radial head separately and get a good fit for the patient. And it's important to note that a bipolar prosthesis in the setting of elbow instability is not appropriate. You can imagine, again, that we want to have a stable lateral column when we're fixing the elbow. And so a bipolar will actually move through the neck and won't improve your stability. So that's not an implant that you want to use in a terrible triad. You want to use something that has a fixed head-neck angle. Just talk for a second about overstuffing. I think most people are familiar with this, not to overstuff the radial head um, into the radial capitellar joint. And probably the best way to actually assess your overstuffing is under direct visualization. So when you place the radial head implant, you want to look and make sure that it's level with the base of the coronoid. Radiographically, you want to make sure that this medial side of the elbow is reduced. Many patients have widening over here on the lateral side. That's a normal finding. So again, if you're unsure, take an x-ray of the other side and make sure that it looks the same. But again, you're really just looking for the symmetry. And this is important in radial head, in terrible triad injuries, 
not just for radio capitellar wear or problems with overstuffing the elbow, but in a terrible triad, if you overstuff, the elbow will be more unstable. So it's a little counterintuitive compared to other arthroplasty procedures where often you will upsize in order to improve stability. In the elbow, if you actually oversize the radial head and have it too wide, your elbow will be more unstable. So you're better to keep the radial head a little bit on the smaller side than on the larger side. So after the coronoid has been repaired, and the uh, radial head has been replaced, the next thing you want to do is look at the lateral ligaments. And one note on the coronoid before I continue, you want to make sure also if you're fixing a type 1 coronoid with sutures that you don't tie those sutures down until you're tying down the lateral side because you're going to be doing a lot of manipulating when you're fixing the radial head. And the last thing you want to have happen is tear out those coronoid sutures right as you're actually about to put your radial head prosthesis in or after it's in because it's really hard to back up a step. So just remember, leave those coronoid sutures, pull them down, make sure they reduce, and then just let them sit, tie them down at the end. So the lateral ligaments come next. And so typically the lateral ligament injury involves an avulsion of the entire lateral ligament complex and often the muscular origins off the lateral epicondyle of the humerus. These are typically acutely repairable lesions and even up to a few weeks um, out from injury, these are definitely repairable. It often comes off as a big sleeve and you can typically utilize that surgical, uh, sorry, that defect for your surgical approach to see the deeper structures, but it's typically a big sleeve that you can pull up and the important part is to make sure that you pull it up to the right spot and get it tensioned appropriately. MCL disruptions occur in the majority of these injuries, but typically they don't require fixation. If they do, they're again a direct suture repair, typically back to the medial epicondyle. So this is typical what a lateral sided injury would look like where the epicondyle has no soft tissue on it. And we go ahead and just repair all those tissues back to the epicondyle. There's lots of ways to do that. You can do it either through bone <coughs> tunnels, um, which works very well if you don't have any suture anchors or suture anchors work extremely well as well. The most important part of doing the lateral ligament repair is to make sure when you tie down the lateral ligaments that the elbow is actually reduced. You have to remember again that when you're supine on an arm table with the arm out on the table, you may be gapped at the radiocapitellar joint because of just the position that you're in and the lateral ligaments are out. So it's important to put the arm up at the side, make sure that the elbow is reduced and put it in pronation, which will give you a tight, your tightest possible repair and then tie down those ligaments and again make sure they're pulled up appropriately to the lateral epicondyle. If you have a loose repair, the elbow will be unstable. This is probably the most important part of the procedure. If the medial side needs fixing, again, it's just a direct repair to the epicondyle. At this point in the procedure, 99.9% .9 of the time you're going to be finished. So this is typically all you need to do for a terrible triad. And you want to assess the range of motion and you want the elbow stable before you leave the operating room. What I typically like to do is make sure I use, let the patient's um, arm kind of go passively with me just holding on with a finger to the hand and letting the arm go through a range of motion because it'll dislocate on its own. If I'm holding it, I'm going to hold it in joint and bring it through a range and convince myself that it's stable. It's easy to do that, but you don't want to do that. You want to make sure that you know that this elbow is stable before you leave the operating room. So as I say, I just put one finger on it and let it go through its own range of motion. If it clicks or clunks or looks unstable, we check under, under x-ray and see what's going on. And typically, if there is a problem with that, it's because your lateral ligament repair is insufficient and hasn't been tight enough. If all your repairs look good, at that point and you're getting some subluxation and that would be an indication to go around to the medial side. I would say that I've done that maybe once in the last five years, so it's very, very uncommon. So if you're finding that you need to go to the medial side routinely, then probably check and see how you're doing with your lateral repairs because that's probably what the problem is. If it's still unstable after you do all of this, so you're convinced that all of the soft tissues have been repaired appropriately, your radial head's a good size, the coronoid's fixed, some of these just still remain unstable. They'll have a really big injury to their capsule. Um, there, some patients have a big heavy arm and it's just really hard to re re restore their stability. In that case, then we would apply an external fixator. In the old days, uh, we used to just put on a hinged external fixator, but we've actually found that those are fraught with complications. You can actually still dislocate in a hinge. So typically what we prefer now is to actually just put these patients to, into a static external fixator, make sure that their elbow is reduced in that static frame and leave it on anywhere from about four to six weeks. It's easier to deal with a stiff elbow, as Dr. Hanna will tell you, that's reduced rather than an unstable elbow that's stiff. So stiff, stiff and reduced is what we would aim for, but again, this would be very uncommon. So if you're having to do this routinely again, check that, the ability of, check your lateral repairs and make sure that you're doing a good job on those. So here's just a couple of cases. 
So this was a young boy who had a dislocation that was reduced at the outside, and he actually showed up with his, ec with his elbow kind of reduced, but it still is a little bit subluxed. And you can see this was us stressing him in the operating room, and so he has a coronoid fracture and a radial head fracture that was actually repairable. And so we went ahead first and pushed his radial head fragments out of the way and were able to reduce his coronoid and hold it with some screws. And then we went ahead and fixed his radial head and then fixed his lateral ligaments. You can see on the image, on the AP image, he's perfectly out straight. So that's an image out straight in supination and he's stable. So we know that this elbow is stable. So that's the next case, this is a case of actually a surgeon who presented after falling while rock climbing. She has a little bit more of a comminuted fracture, but again, once we actually started looking at this, we realized that the radial head fracture was in a spot that was amenable to plate fixation for the safe zone and that we could get good fixation. So this shows really nicely what a typical terrible triad will look like. You can see that there's no soft tissue here attached to the lateral epicondyle. There should be soft tissue attached all the way down to this level. So all of those tissues have been torn off and they're sitting up here. So this is where all the lateral ligaments and muscular origins are sitting in this patient. You can see that we have a reduction of the radial head, which will subsequently plate. And here's the coronoid sutures. So they're not tied down, but they're actually placed. You can also see that this arm is straight out, or is lying out on the arm table, and there's a gap between the radial head and the capitellum. And again, that's that varus gap that you get with the arm in this position. So before we end up tying down her ligaments eventually, we'll put her arm up at 90 and make sure that we have nice congruity between the radial head and the capitellum as we do that repair. And so here's what she looks like after fixation. And again, the plate's in the safe zone. When we're finished, we make sure that she has full rotation and nothing's impinging. And you can see we also have checked that she's stable out in full extension as well. And she ended up healing everything and doing quite well with a good range of motion. And this last case that I'm going to show, this is a patient who tripped and fell um, while intoxicated. And he actually came about a week later to the hospital. And here he is with a dislocated elbow, quite a comminuted radial head, and a comminuted coronoid fracture, uh, supposedly. So we went ahead and we actually felt that we could repair his coronoid, coronoid with a screw. It was a little bit of a bigger fragment. So we did that after doing the radial neck resection. And so here he is with his radial head implant put in place and his forearm in neutral rotation at 90 degrees and he's reduced. This really shows the importance of the lateral collateral ligament repair because you can see here, the lateral collateral ligament's not repaired yet. And so with him in pronation, he's nicely reduced, but in supination, even at 90 degrees without his lateral collateral ligaments repaired, he's still unstable. And the instability is not just the radial heads not lining up with the capitellum, that's a good radiographic feature, but what's really happening is this whole thing is hinging open. And so you can see that there's actually ulno humeral instability. So if you compare the image on the left to the image on the right, that's what the problem is. So this whole thing will hinge open. This is classic posterolateral rotatory instability that will only be fixed once you fix the lateral ligaments. And so we went ahead and fixed the lateral ligaments with suture anchors, and you can see now pronation and supination, he stays reduced. So that's again an example to show how important that lateral ligament repair is in these patients and he went on to actually get a good stable elbow and a reasonable result. How do we rehab these patients? Well typically we'll place them into a posterior splint at about 90 degrees um, of elbow flexion with the forearm in the position of the greatest stability. Typically that's pro neutral to pronation. Um, if you fix both sides then you want to you want to place them into neutral. And we'll typically start active and active assisted motion. Now, some, sometimes we'll start fairly early within a couple of days of surgery, but as we actually just learned at our grand rounds or at our visiting, from our visiting professor, it's probably okay to leave these patients in their splints for even longer, up to 10 days. But important while they're in their splint is to have them actually start to actively contract their muscles in the splint. So we know that active, mo active motion around the elbow will enhance elbow stability, and it's really important for these patients to start doing that. We want to avoid terminal extension and supination for the first few weeks. That's probably the worst position. And especially if you've sewn up the anterior capsule with the coronoid, that'll actually just pull apart your coronoid repair if you put them out too straight. So you want to actually avoid that last little bit of extension. Most patients won't do it anyway. And then they can flex and extend their elbow while they're pronated if you've done a lateral repair. And then once they're up at 90 degrees, that's when they can do pronation and supination. All of the exercises should be done either with the arm at the side or up overhead to avoid any varus stress. You don't want the patients putting the elbow up higher than their hand because they'll just pull apart their lateral repair and induce stability. So arm at the side and active motion is the most important. We took a look at how our terrible triads uh, 
we're doing here at Harborview, and we had 52 patients that we found. We had 34 with adequate follow-up, but of the first of the 52, we could check to see if how many had acute recurrent instability. We could see from Neil's talk that early on that was a problem, early recurrent instability. And in our patient group, there was really very minimal early recurrent instability. One patient fell and had a redislocation, but overall the patient stayed reduced using this protocol. Of the patients that had longer follow-up, we had 34 of those, and nine of those patients ended up undergoing a secondary procedure for elbow stiffness. And they obtained quite good motion, and in fact, they obtained similar motion to those patients that did not require release. So the bottom line from our findings is that these patients actually do quite well, but they won't have a normal range of motion. They will have a functional range of motion, and those patients that end up do requiring a secondary procedure will end up with a quite good range of motion as well. So overall, the injury, although can be terrible, can actually do pretty well with the right protocol. And so I'm going to let Dr. Hanel talk about how he manages the stiff ones that we send to him. Thank you. Um, Management of the stiff elbow is divided into three, into three periods, the early, intermediate, and late. And in the early management, as we have seen, this is doing it right the first time with two millimeter step offs and creating a stable fixation. Also, we learned that if we can't keep it stable and we can't work on early motion, it's better to reduce the joint, keep it in place, and although this happens to be a supracondylar humerus fracture, it is much better to keep this unstable fixation or tenuous fixation in a stable elbow position before starting motion. And if a static fixture was necessary to keep that in position, we would. It's easier to take care of a stiff elbow that is reduced than one that is not. In the intermediate setting, in the acute setting, is there a role for radiation? I don't think so. Is there a role for NSAIDs? I don't think so. And there's definitely not a role for continuous passive motion, all of which have been touted in the literature and certainly in the textbook literature. So there's strong opinion, but very little science to that end. The one thing that we do know, and especially we know from the study that we just saw, was that active and active range of motion are the motion that we deal with in the rehabilitation of the elbow after these injuries, and all injuries about the elbow. We do know especially that one thing that we do avoid is this. And although it may be very gratifying and very satisfying in those patients that when you take and you passively mobilize them and you hear that pop and that grind and that crunch, as you release that elbow and manipulation, all you are really doing is stimulating heterotopic ossification. So avoid passive motion, especially in the setting of a head injury. There are various devices that are that are touted as being of benefit, um, static and static progressive devices. And again, these, the benefit is truly anecdotal. And if you go online and you look at it, Google, there are as many terrible reports about using these devices as there are good. And so it, uh, it sits there at about the one and a half to two star rating by the public. So in our cases, and the cases that you saw from Daphne, you know, at about six to eight weeks after you've regained your motion, that's when we start strengthening. We don't start strengthening until late, six to eight weeks. And in those cases, at the end of that six to eight weeks, then patients are released to work. Okay? And although it has been pointed out to me that these elbows in this particular piece of art in front of the, uh, our museum, downtown Seattle, I know those happen to be stiff elbows, but the point is, is that we do release our patients to work in the great, great, great majority of cases, except when we don't. And so that's the remainder of this discussion, is what do we do with this particular patient and for these particular patients who get a different type of release than release to work. And so I'd like as background, you know, why is that stiff elbow a problem? And you think about this, you go, well, Here's what a shoulder does. And granted, I, I do a lot of hand, do a lot of elbow surgery. I'm not a shoulder surgeon purposely, in this, certainly in this program, because of the quality of, of the shoulder surgeons that we have in our department that are so much better than I am. But I am hand-centric. So what is a shoulder good for? Well, a shoulder takes the hand and puts it on the surface of a sphere. That's what its function is. 
And what's an elbow good for? Well, an elbow takes and places the hand within the volume of a sphere. So if I fuse an elbow, or I mean if I fuse a shoulder and have a stiff shoulder, what's that do? Well, that decreases the volume of the sphere. I and mean, these are illustrations that are from Bernie Mori and Rich Berger at the Mayo Clinic. What happens when I have a stiff elbow? Well, that destroys motion within that. So if I have a stiff elbow at 80 degrees, I have less than 10% of the volume touched by that hand that I did when I didn't have a stiff elbow. And similarly so. I get to choose which 10% I want if I have a stiff elbow or an ankylosed elbow. Or if I choose to fuse somebody's elbows, which 10% do you want? Do you want it out here or do you want it here? And as we heard last week from Graham King, he prefers 80 degrees. And for the, my residents, the last one that we fused was at 120 degrees because that's where the patient chose to do that. My approach to the late stiff elbow is the following. is There's three classification systems, two of which are used for reporting and helpful. And one of them actually helps at operation. The first one was described by Maury at the Mayo Clinic. And he just divides them up into simple and complex. And simple is that reduced elbow that was fixed, has less than two millimeter step offs, but is just stiff. And the complex ones are the intraarticular fracture malunions, fracture malunions, or subluxed elbows with associated heterotopic ossification. K in 19, the late 1900s described, or in 1998, late 20th century, described or broke them up into those that have identifiable bone and those that are just soft tissue injuries. And for the most part, the ones that I see and the ones that we, we've seen here are a bony injury and a bony bar. Hill Hastings and Tom Graham at uh, the Indiana Hand Center said, here, we'll just classify these by where they are. And in the setting of terrible triad, that particular area of involvement happens to be in this area right here for the great majority and the great part of this. So my management and treatment is centered around the patient. What are my inner indications for operative fixation? First of all, the patient has to perceive that this is a deficit. If it's not a problem for the patient, it's not a problem for me. The patient has got to have demonstrated that they have a willingness to participate in therapy and a willingness to give up the, next, the great majority of the next six weeks of their lives after operation because they become the elbow. And although we spend a whole lot of time talking to the patient, immediately post-op, everybody is looking at the elbow. They walk into the room, they look at the elbow, and then they look at the patient. You know, the best physicians. And for me, best physicians are, you look at Rick Matz, comes in, looks at the patient, then looks at the shoulder in that order. You know, I'm not that good. I usually look straight at the elbow and then at the patient and acknowledge that I'm not that good. But I think the point is, is that the patient has to be willing to really give their effort to do this, or you're going to end up with a worse or more stiff elbow, or at the very, the very least the same that you started preoperatively. The preoperative evaluation it comes documentation of real range of motion. And how well do you do that? And how you do that, as long as you do it consistently, you will be able to help your patient. The neurologic evaluation is particularly important, especially the ulnar nerve, because if you're releasing flexion, extension, elbow deficits, and you don't release the ulnar nerve, you're going to have a very painful patient. And in some patients, they will refuse to move their elbow after release because of, the elbow, because of the ulnar nerve that is trapped or scarred down at the elbow. Plain radiographs will reveal most everything that we need to know about this, but if there's involvement in the proximal radial ulnar joint, I routinely will get a CT scan to judge where I have to go and where I have to be in order to release this particular elbow. The timing of surgery is when the fracture is stable and when the patient is ready. Now, the earliest presented series, cohorts of patients with the earliest surgical intervention is by Dean Satirianos, 
um, specifically addressing heterotopic ossification related to biceps tendon repairs. And his earliest repairs were six to eight weeks after um, the development of heterotopic ossification or the identification of that in forearms that were stiff after biceps repairs. Most of ours, and the series that was presented by Randy Viola and myself, um, are typical of this. Somewhere between seven to nine months is our early repair in, in these particular patients. One thing that we do know is that a bone scan will remain hot for 24 to 26 months after fracture and fracture dislocation and is of no benefit to us in the timing of these particular procedures. My approach, my dissection, is long sweeping exposures. And in this particular case, because I'm going to approach this particular bony uh, bridge, I'm going to use a Boyd-Anderson approach, which if you read about that is a condemned approach and is fraught with disaster because it's known to have an increase in heterotopic ossification. Well, the reason that that is, is it was used in the setting of trauma. It was used in the setting of use of tourniquets and, and ex exposure through tourniquets. And when I do my releases, I do not use tourniquets. I want to know what's bleeding, and I want to control that bleeding at the time that I'm doing the release. By using a broad sweeping elevation of the muscles taking origin off the ulna and sweeping across the interosseous ligament and interosseous membrane, I can lift up all of the tissues off of that dorsal exposure and in doing so, I gently sweep the posterior interosseous nerve and the content of the extensor tendons um, off of the radius without putting it under undue pressure. And then we remove the bridge and remove the heterotopic ossification. And then we have to manage the proximal radial ulnar joint. Now, this is the one case and the only case where I recommend radiation postoperatively. I don't use it for flexion extension. I don't use it for forearm synostosis or distal radial ulnar joint synostosis, but I do continue to use it in this one location. And again, this is my anecdote, and it's an anecdote that is shared by a number of uh, shoulder, elbow, hand surgeons. The question also is, is can you put an interposition material between the radius and the ulna, or should you? And the answer is, I think so. I have never done this as a double-blind randomized study, but I've done it as a cohort of patients. And I place allograft fascia lata between the radius and the ulna only in those cases where the heterotopic ossification bridges the proximal radial ulnar joint. Jeff Friedrich, now my partner, as a resident um, along with uh, Leo Katolik, who was a hand fellow at the time, reviewed 13 of our patients that we had done. And we note that our preoperative to postoperative improvement, both in pronation and supination, was 40 degrees. And in the 20 years since that, or the 10 years since that study, we have done another 20 cases. And this continues to be um, a typical finding and typical of the outcome of these particular patients. The postoperative management of these patients remains as Daphne demonstrated and Daphne outlined. We start by returning to active, active assist range of motion. I do not use continuous passive motion on forearm contractures, or, or in, especially if they're combined with elbow contractures. After we have regained range of motion, which is at six to eight weeks, we start strengthening. And after that, we have our patient return to work activities. So what did we learn today? Well, we learned a couple things. The terrible triad is not so terrible if you understand the anatomy. And if you put it back together appropriately as demonstrated by Dr. Terabacher and Dr. Byengaster. With our therapy directed at active, active assist range of motion will decrease the amount of heterotopic ossification stiffness that we have in our elbows. And hopefully all of our late releases will be released to work. So thank you.
have to say, every time I do one of these and I see that the radial head's fixable, I, I'm disappointed because yeah, it's hard. And so right, right away I was like, are you sure you can fix this? Oh, yeah, I can fix this one. So I think probably the key to that is getting enough exposure across the front. So oftentimes when they're fixable, sometimes the anterior capsule is still a little bit intact. And I tend to actually just lift all of that off the front. Up, so I, up the yeah, so I actually may make the elbow a little bit more unstable than what I found it in order to actually get around the front because I know I can repair all that stuff at the end. And then it, just sort of knowing in your head that this is going to be a pain, a pain to fix that coronoid. And oftentimes what I'll do in those ones, especially if they're fairly acute, is actually dislocate the elbow, do all the preparation of the coronoid base part with the elbow dislocated because you can actually get a pretty good view of it behind there. And then reduce it, pull that anterior capsule forward, and then struggle a little bit to get that stitch up there. But typically you can do it um, and pull it back. So it's doable, but it's difficult. But it's just a matter of being patient and maybe taking it down a bit more soft tissue. Yes. <laughs> so, Daphne, I have a question for you. In the cases that you presented, we didn't see any CT scans. Is there a role of CT scan in the evaluation of elbow fractures and fracture dislocation? So I think that there probably is. Um, typically for terrible triads, for me, I kn if I know I'm going to be operating on these, I'm going to have a pretty good view around the whole elbow. I typically don't find the CT scans all that useful. Um, just because they typically are done out of plane and you can't really get a lot more information than you're going to get. But there's certainly patterns that if they don't appear to be like a typical terrible triad or if you're concerned that you have a medial coronoid type of fracture or there's something more going on, then I think there definitely is a role for a CT scan. And like Dr. King said when he was here visiting us, if you're sort of early on in your practice and you're really a little bit unsure about what's going on around the elbow in a fracture dislocation, certainly a CT scan can be helpful, but you have to make sure that the CT techs actually get them in the right plane. Because if you look through a lot of elbow CTs, they're completely useless because you don't quite have the right plane, and so they don't give you information that's useful. So I think CT scans do have a role. Probably some 3D CT scans will actually help you as well figure out what's going on. But typically for... The, so your standard terrible try that you know you're going to be looking at the whole thing, it doesn't add a whole lot to the treatment. So that, that very last phrase attests to the experience that Dr. Beingastner has, you know, for your typical terrible triad. For most of us, and uh, most of the people in the audience, we aren't going to have a typical terrible triad in our practices. We'll see one or two of these, and I think that the one thing that is that is really important with, and the use of CT scans comes into not what you see on your x-ray, but whether or not you can identify the medial coronoid. And I see in my practice dealing with stiff elbows that the misdiagnosis is a lot of medial coronoid problems and coronoid instability because of that. I so I'd, re I'd recommend using CT scans early in a career. I agree. Yeah. I, I, this for you, Doug. Yes. You dispelled our, our long held notions regarding radiation, NSAIDs. Uh, Mel Rosenwasser has talked about using Botox uh, anteriorly to relax against spasm to help facilitate motion. Uh, uh, what's your take on that? You know, I, and I, I'm aware of that. Um, I don't know, and I really don't know that. I think it's very, very difficult to find the endpoints, to just inject Botox into biceps is a tough thing to do, and so even in the best of hands, that's, that seems to be difficult. Um, I, and so I have, I know his experience, I believe everything he says, I just can't repeat it, or have it. Jerry. Can you can you use the mic just for a second? So, um, first off, great presentations. Uh, we talked about how rare it is to have to go medial for any medial repair or uh, reconstruction. How do you plan a surgical approach as far as when do you go lateral, when do you go posterior? Does it really depend on how big the exposure you really need, also the possible need for a subsequent postoperative uh, HO takedown or a contraction release? How do you really, as far as planning ahead and thinking ahead? So for me, I tend to approach almost every elbow through a posterior midline incision. So I go posteriorly, I curve a little bit laterally. Um, and typically, I'm, the traumatic rent is really right near Cofer's interval. So it is already fairly posterior. 
And I think um, for me, then I know that if I have to go medial, that I can just lift that flap up and go on the other side. I think some of the problem with going with a straight lateral incision, as you know, is you're actually probably too anterior to where all of the actual damaged structures are. And I think that's probably why some of these have recurrent instability in people that don't fix very many of them, because you're actually going to miss the majority of that injury. If you're way too around the front, you won't actually appreciate how much stuff is torn off um, from the epicondyle and posteriorly. So for me, almost every elbow gets a posterior midline approach. I very rarely do separate medial and lateral approaches. And in fact, I can't think of the last one unless it's been something like a traumatic wound or something like that that I'm working through. And I think that that probably helps Doug when I send these to him because he can basically go back through my posterior midline incision, I think. Yeah, I, for me, I use the incision that I'm given. But if I need to go medial and lateral, that means that if it happens to start as a lateral incision, I may just go straight posterior medial and leave the lateral, the old lateral incision in place. But if I, I, um, I unless it's really, really a simple release, I won't do independent medial and lateral incisions, although that has become increasingly popular with some of those surgeons that lecture on stiff elbows uh, throughout the country. Um, in raising the flaps that we do, it's argued that you have a higher incidence of seromas. Um, I drain my wounds. I do tack down my sub-Q to uh, the muscular investing fascia. And the, the development of um, troublesome seromas has been very, very limited. So that's the, expo that's the exposure I use. Thanks. Anything else? Dr. Worm. So, so the question from Dr. Worm is, how often do we use external fixtures? And I'll give that to Daphne. In, in doing elbow release surgery, I do somewhere around 20 cases a year. And um, I put on an external fixture every other year. And I, so I guess it's about 1 in 40. How about you, Dan? Yeah, for us, um, for terrible triads, I, it's pretty rare to have to put on an external fixator. It's probably about the same frequency as the... MCL repair, quite frankly for me, the, the more unstable elbows that need an X fix in my practice are the actual simple dislocations. We get a lot sort of like from blast injuries or those types of things that are really, really unstable. And so in my practice, those actually are more likely to go into an external fixator than a terrible triad where I've actually fixed most of the structure. So pretty uncommon to have to put them in. I, again, probably I've put an X fix on a terrible triad once again in the last few years. A simple elbow dislocation, I've probably done once every two years or so. We need to put one in. Um, but those actually, as they say, tend to be a little bit worse than the terrible triads. Yeah. Yes, actually, when we've had occasional patients that we have had to do that in. We have some patients that are either really non-compliant or we don't what think we'll be able to... Question? Putting a screw across the joint. Well, the oh, sorry. Putting a screw across the joint was the question. Um, yes. So sometimes we do have to do that again in sort of more non-compliant patients that we don't think can handle an external fixator, or patients that have come back with late recurrent instability that we don't think are good candidates for uh, reconstructions. They may get a cross screw just to get stiff. And again, that's uncommon, but again, maybe about once a year or so, we probably do something like that. I actually use a bigger screw, so I use a four or five shaft screw, so because the shaft screw has a thicker area that's less likely to break. And the most important part of putting those in is to make sure that the tip of the screw, the end of it, is actually through the back cortex just in case it breaks, because then it's easier to get it out. Thank you. I, I'd like to compliment Neil on a, a very precise and very succinct discussion of anatomy. And for the residents that are doing later grand rounds. Use this as a role model. This is a great way to present anatomy and to present a problem. So thank you, Neil. Neil has to go. Hold on. One, one more quick announcement. Uh, Chris, stand up. So I just want to, he, he was a little late. I'm sure he was trying to find this place. So uh, Chris Kwan is our new surgeon at the U that's going to be joining uh, Trey and, and Albert uh, in our sports program. And we're very excited to have him.
Chris started on Monday, and some people have known him for a long time as an undergraduate. He was actually working in the sports medicine clinic, so he goes back a long ways, and everybody knows him and loves him who has worked with him, so welcome. We're really excited. 